Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Drew Hull. Uh, my wife, Sarah, is Don and Tracy's daughter. So I managed to sneak into the Hooten clan like six years ago. And we just moved to Texas after living in Nashville for the last six years. Um, so a month ago today, we've moved to Texas. So I don't know if I'm supposed to greet you guys with a howdy or what, um, but we live in the Bryan College Station area. And one of the cool things about moving across the country and meeting new people is that you get to connect with Christians who you've never met before. And immediately, regardless of if you know how old they are or where they work or what their background is, you know, I have the most important thing in common with you. And we both love the Lord. And as a result, there's instant connection. So for those of you that we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm excited to share this morning with you the most important thing that we have in common in God's Word. Um, and even if we do know each other a little bit and we've never talked about the most important things, like I'm excited to get a chance to start talking about deep and spiritual things together. This morning, I'm going to do my best Don Hooten impression. Uh, I texted him this morning and said, I don't have a cheesy joke, but I am wearing my Crocs. Uh, for him, and I'm, I'm not actually. But we are going to be studying the book of Zephaniah, which in your pew Bibles is on page 707. That's maybe helpful because the book of Zephaniah is oftentimes overlooked, perhaps because it's stuck next to a book called Zechariah, and those are both pretty obscure and small little books in the Old Testament. But Zephaniah is really important. It was really important in the day that it was written. It's really important for us to understand today. And we learn a lot about God in the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah is the last chance prophet with a last chance message. We'll understand a little bit more about what that means. But in order for us to actually comprehend the contents of the book, we have to have the context. And hopefully that's not too small for you. But we read in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 1 that the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So Josiah is the grandson of Manasseh and Ammon. And if you know anything about Manasseh and Ammon, you know that they were like, atrocious, evil, awful leaders. Manasseh in particular reigned for 55 years and he instituted idol worship, not just in the nation of Israel, but like specifically in the temple of God, he set up idol worship. Manasseh engaged in child sacrifice and burned two of his own sons in ritual sacrifice. He was evil. And he led the people into idolatry. Manasseh repents at the end of his life, but like all of the momentum that he has built in leading the people into idolatry was a runaway freight train. And so even though his personal repentance is recorded for us, that had become the standard in the culture of the day. And so when his son Ammon becomes king, he just operates in the same way that he's seen his dad Manasseh operate and for two years that he reigns, he's terrible and wicked, and he doesn't repent like his dad. So much so that the people actually rise up and they kill Ammon. And so Josiah becomes king at eight years old. So if we're going to understand the message that came to Josiah in the days when he was king, that's really important context. Because idolatry is the status quo. Wickedness from the kings and the leaders and the officials and the rulers of the nation of Israel and Judah, that is like the normal thing. Right? Um, so prophets like Zephaniah, and then later in Josiah's life, they actually find and uncover the book of the law. They rediscover God's word that had been lost, and that leads to Josiah trying to push nationwide reforms. And spoiler alert, uh, those reforms 
somewhat similar to Manasseh, they don't outlive the, the lead reformer. So when Josiah dies, uh, all of the judgment and the message that we're going to read about, that's when it's executed. So Zephaniah is the last prophet sent to Judah before the nation of, of, of Judah goes into Babylonian captivity and exile. So after Zephaniah, we don't hear of any other prophets. He's the last one that comes before Babylon. Right? So he's the last chance prophet with a last chance message. Let's start reading. There's three chapters. We're not going to cover every single verse just for the sake of time, but we will try and go through as much of it as we can. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. You may have a footnote in your Bible there for rubble that talks about stumbling blocks or idols. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Does that language sound familiar to you? I will utterly sweep away from the face of the earth. Does that make you think of anything else in the Bible where God sweeps everything away from the face of the earth? It's the flood. Yeah, this is the same type of language that God uses to describe the flood back in Genesis. And specifically, he's like decreating everything that he's created in the order of, hey, we've got uh, the fish and the birds and the animals and mankind and everything that I had created, I'm going to decreate it. I'm going to wipe it away. Well, this is really intense. So why? What's, what's going on? We'll keep reading. In verse 4, I'll stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal, a Canaanite god, and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom an Ammonite god. Other translations have the name Molech, who was that same god that the people engaged in with child sacrifice to this god. Those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of Him. So this sweeping, biblical, flood language judgment is coming on the people because God's people have completely stopped seeking Him. They're not trying to follow him. They're not trying to inquire of him. They say maybe they do, but at the same time, what they're trusting in is all the gods of the other nations, which is not compatible with actually trusting in and following God in the first place. So we pick up in verse 7. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. That's a phrase that is mentioned um, that indicates judgment. This day of the Lord. When you see that phrase, that means that impending judgment is coming. And in the Bible, that phrase, the day of the Lord, is referenced like 26 times. But 18 of those 26 times are in the book of Zephaniah. So like, what do we think the book of Zephaniah is probably going to be about? It's about a lot of judgment that's coming. Read down in verse 8. And on that day of the Lord's sacrifice, on that day of the, the day of the Lord, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. Verse 9 says, on that day I'll punish everyone who leaps over the threshold, which is a reference to how they would worship some of these Canaanite gods, and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. And so like, yeah, idol worship, for sure, that's going to get punished. 
and violence and fraud, that makes sense that that would get punished. But what's the big deal about dressing in foreign clothes? Like we just had a big soccer game in College Station and if I was to wear a Brazil soccer jersey, like is that a big problem? What's the deal with wearing foreign attire? Is that God's issue here? He's saying this is a problem that you're dressing like the other nations because you're dressing like them because you want to look like them, because you want to act like them, because you want to live like them and worship like them. And so when you're affiliating yourselves with these foreign nations who are worshiping anything other than the real God, that's what you're saying is king in your life and your heart. So I'm going to punish the officials who are supposed to know better. This next section of uh, verses 10 and 11 talk about how every area of Jerusalem is going to be wailing and crying out. Like nobody's going to escape this judgment. Verse 12 says, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And that may not seem like a particularly uh, noteworthy phrase to you, but do you know what this makes me think of in my head? This is like when a SWAT team enters a house or a building or a room and they come in and they've got their like hyper tactical flashlights and they're coming in and they're checking under every nook and cranny and doorway because they're on a manhunt for certain people. And no stone is left unturned. And that's what God says he's going to do in Jerusalem. He says, at that time, I'm going to search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Or in other words, there are people inside of God's people and inside of God's city that think, I'm not seeing a lot of benefit from when I'm serving God. And I'm not seeing a lot of consequences for when I disobey God. So like maybe he doesn't actually really care how I live. Maybe I don't really need to repent and get out of my sins. And what's the point of me trying to be so righteous? Because it doesn't seem to do much. And so I can just be complacent. And those are the people that God says he's going to search out. You may have a footnote um, around that word complacent. The Hebrew phrase here is those who are thickening on the dregs. And 500 bonus points to whoever knows what thickening on the dregs means. I had to look that up. Um, it references like when you're in the process of making wine and you have grapes that are all crushed up, and if you leave them in the liquid for too long, in that sediment, it actually thickens and hardens and it becomes a syrup. So if you leave it in there for too long, these grapes change and your, your wine goes into syrup. And what God is saying here with this warning of using this language against the complacent people is that if you're complacent in your sins, it will change you. It will thicken you and harden you. And so I'm going to punish that. He says in the next few verses that their houses are going to be plundered and laid waste. And then there's this large section of 14 through 18. And this talks about what that day of the Lord, that day of judgment, is going to be like. Some of this is um, hard to read, by the way, just full transparency. It's uh, not pleasant. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. It is right around the corner. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. So think of the biggest, toughest, baddest dude that you know, and he's crying loudly on the day of the Lord because he can't do anything about it to stop it. And that day is a day of wrath and distress and anguish and ruin and devastation and darkness and gloom and clouds and thick darkness and trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. And God says in verse 17, I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk 
like the blind. They're going to stumble around because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood is going to be poured out like dust and scattered and their flesh spread out like dung or manure. And neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord because in the fire of His jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end He will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Something like this. Like a, it probably wouldn't have modern day houses in it, but something like this is pictured here. Like this is dark and scary and doomsday language. So how are we feeling about Zephaniah? If, if we just like zoom out real quick. Like if you are hearing our boy Zephaniah give this message back in the day, like how, how are you receiving that? How are you feeling? If you live in Jerusalem or Judah, how are you going to react? I would be terrified and horrified at this message. I think we're supposed to. So in chapter 2, at the start, these first uh, couple verses, he gathers together the people. He says, gather together, yes, gather together, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect. So before that message that I just said about doom that's coming, gather around and listen up. This is him saying, like, there's only a few seconds left on the shot clock, and like, we can try and get a buzzer beater in here, but you got to listen real quick to what I'm about to say, because this doom is coming before the anger of the Lord comes upon you. So what is his urgent message? What does he want to communicate to these people that the day of the Lord is coming against? He says, seek the Lord. All you humble of the land, you who do his just commands, seek righteousness and seek humility. You haven't been seeking God. You haven't been inquiring of Him. But stop that and turn and repent. Because perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. I don't know that we have anybody in the audience named Zephaniah this morning. If you are, please raise your hand. That would be super cool. I would love to... Love to meet you. Um, but does anybody know what the name Zephaniah means? The Lord hides. Zephaniah means Yahweh hides or Yahweh protects. Or Yahweh has hidden. Yahweh has protected. And so this is Yahweh hides saying, you guys need to repent so that Yahweh can hide. Or God will protect you, but you have to repent so that God will protect you. Some super cool wordplay that the guy whose name is Zephaniah, that, that ends up being a big part of his message. So he tells these people, you have to repent, you have to seek God, you have to seek righteousness, and you have to seek humility. The next section in the rest of chapter 2 is about judgment but it's not about judgment on Jerusalem and Judah anymore. So if the first chapter is like a look within the nation of Judah, this is now, chapter 2, a look around at these surrounding nations who the people wanted to be like so much that they dressed like and they acted like and they worshipped like. Well, what's going to happen to those people? And Zephaniah systematically goes through and calls out all of the different nations to the east and the west and the north and the south of Israel and says, guess what? This same judgment is coming against all of them too. And they're all going to be destroyed. It turns out that God actually really does care how you worship and who you worship and how you live, whether you're of the nation of Israel, or you're of any other nation. And God had sent prophets to these other nations and had asked them to repent, but they wouldn't do it. 
Gaza will be deserted. Ashkelon, another city, is going to be desolate. Ashdod's people, they're going to be out of here, driven out by the time it's even noon. The seacoast nations where the Philistines live, your big, mighty cities, you think you're so strong, you think you're so powerful and independent and untouchable, God's going to knock you down, and instead of big, fortified cities, you know what it's going to be? He says it's going to be pastures. You know who's going to live there? It's not you anymore. A bunch of sheep are going to live there. That's what's going to become of your big, powerful nation because you won't turn and trust in the Lord. We do see in verses 7 and 10 of chapter 2 this little glimmer of hope. In verse 7, it talks about the remnant of the house of Judah. That pops up again in verse 9, actually, instead of verse 10. That remnant, which references this hope and this um, reality that there's going to be a few people who listen to Zephaniah's message. There's going to be a few people who repent and who seek the Lord and seek righteousness with humility. And as a result, God's going to protect them, God's going to save them, and in verse 7, He's going to be mindful of them. But there's very different reactions for these people who are willing to listen to the fact that God cares how you live and that God wants you to worship Him? You can really go one of two ways. You can be prideful when God says you have sin and wrong and brokenness in your life, or you can be humble. And the people who are proud, like the nations of Moab and Ammon, God says, I'm going to make them like Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to completely destroy them and knock them out. In verse 10 of chapter 2, this shall be their lot in return for their pride because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. They taunted and boasted against God instead of repenting. Verse 11 says, the Lord will be awesome against them. Talking about these other nations. The Lord will be awesome against them. This is sometimes problematic because I don't know how you use the word awesome. Um, I use it to describe like that was an awesome cup of coffee, right? Or like, oh, hey, man, uh, that was an awesome workout. Or we were just singing an awesome song. That's not the kind of awesome that God is going to be towards these nations that he's bringing judgment on. This is where the, the translation can make a big difference because awesome means all full or full of awe awe-inspiring, or in this case, terrifying. God is going to be terrifying to these nations, and He's going to famish or knock down all the gods, all the false things that people worship and put their trust in. And interestingly enough, in verse 11, we get a sneak peek of how this book is going to end. That all the nations of the earth shall bow down, each in its place, and worship God. So God is going to knock down and remove all the things that people trust in instead of Him. And at the end of the day, they're going to trust in Him. This judgment on the nations uh, specifically talks about Nineveh. You guys remember Nineveh? Jonah is supposed to go to Nineveh. He's one of these prophets that is sent to Nineveh. So like they repented for a little while. God wanted these people to repent, but it didn't stick. And so specifically, he says Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, which has conquered the nation of Israel and is like this leading world city. The only people who are going to live in Nineveh are going to be wild animals. And when people walk by Nineveh, they're going to say, verse 15, they're going to say, this is the exultant city that lives securely and said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. Or in other words, to reuse that definition of awesome, I'm awesome and I'm worth worship. And I don't need to follow God or I don't need to listen to God because we 
are powerful, and we have a booming economy and a big army, and we worship other gods, and we worship anything else that we want to. And God says, I'm going to knock you down. And specifically, that reminds me of the Tower of Babel, right? When God dealt with another group of people that wanted to make a name for themselves and say, we are unlike anybody else. But God knocked them down, and he's going to knock down Nineveh too. So that's chapter 2. It's judgment on the nations. Um, Chapter 3, as we make our way towards our conclusion here of of our lesson, chapter 3, the first eight verses kind of circle back to where he started, talking about judgment on Jerusalem. But do you notice anything specific about chapter 3 and verse 1? How do we know he's talking about Jerusalem? Because Zephaniah doesn't call Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem means city of peace. And he says, I can't call you the city of peace. Because that's not what you are. And so instead, he calls the city by names that are actually truly indicative of how they're living. He says, woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. And then these next few verses highlight the depths to which the people and the city have fallen. Her officials are roaring lions, consuming and devouring the people. Her judges are like wolves that come in, and they don't even leave anything until the morning. They're so quick to devour the people. And her prophets are fickle. They do whatever they want, and they're treacherous. And the priests in this city, they don't lift up God. They profane it, and they do violence against the law. God, on the other hand, in verse 5, is consistent. He's just. He's not like that, but the people know no shame. So all of this has been leading up, and see if you can see God's reaction and His tone, because I think it's really curious and interesting in what He says in verses 6 and 7. in the context of all these judgments that have just been read on these other nations, God says back to Jerusalem, He says, listen y'all, I have cut off nations and their battlements are in ruins. I've laid waste their streets so that nobody even walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. And I said, surely, surely, you will listen to me. You will fear me and you will accept correction. And then, if you do, your dwelling wouldn't be cut off according to the judgments I have against you. Or in other words, have you guys not just seen all of the judgments that I'm going to give to these other nations who you want to trust in and be so much like? Have you not listened to them? Surely you would see what worshiping other things than me gets you the reality of that, and how it's broken, and there's judgment coming on that. And I thought, surely when you see this, you would listen to me. And if you just listen to me, and turn to me, and repent, I'd show you mercy. And I'd take away your judgments. But all the more, they were eager to make their deeds corrupt. God, at the that the usage of a $5 word here, is incredulous. He can't believe it. He's like, I want these people to see and to turn to me. And I can't believe they won't. So the conclusion of all of these judgments is in verse 8. Therefore, because of that, because you won't listen, wait for me for the day when I rise up to seize the prey For my decision is to gather kingdoms and to 
assembled nations to pour out on them my indignation, my anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. So because you guys won't listen, that day of the Lord is coming. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I appreciate your persistence and uh, your endurance in slogging through three chapters worth of hellfire and brimstone. Happy Father's Day, right? Um, what a dark and gloomy and dreary message, right? But this is a dark and gloomy and dreary message for a reason. It was a dark and gloomy and dreary message to these people. But lucky for them and lucky for us, Zephaniah doesn't end in chapter 3 and verse 8. And just when you expect at the, the highest point of tension when God says, you wouldn't listen after I judged you and I judged the nations and now I'm just going to burn everything up, Read verse 9 of chapter 3. For at that time, on that fierce day of the Lord, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord and my worshipers are going to come from everywhere as far down as Ethiopia? Like, is this still Zephaniah? Like, where... Where on earth has this come from? What is this about? That is not what I would have expected after all of this message of judgment that's coming. And now, all the people of the earth are going to come together shoulder to shoulder and worship God on that day? How does that work? This is like a reversal of that Tower of Babel picture where previously all the people were speaking a common language, but they were wanting to elevate themselves, and so God scattered them. And instead, here what's pictured is a reversal of that, where all these people who were worshiping other gods and speaking different languages come together with a common language to worship one God, the true God. Verse 11. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for I will remove from your midst your proud, exultant ones. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So God's anger and judgment that comes down on the same people who have two options. You can either be humble and seek humility and seek righteousness and seek the Lord and be hidden and protected or you can be stubborn and be consumed. And his judgment works like a purifying fire. Like if you have metal and you heat that metal up really hot, all of the impurities and the filth and the dirt gets burned away. But what's left over at the end of it is pure and clean and strong. And that's what God says, is that I've got judgment that's coming on the whole world, but you get to choose how you want to come out of that. If you're willing to repent with humility, you're going to be able to take refuge in me. I'm going to hide you and protect you. Zephaniah. And so the people who are left behind, these people who engage in true worship with humility and lowliness, they look and act a whole lot different than the people who are proud. And so Israel and Judah as a whole look and act a whole lot different. I think this is important for us to understand that like 
God has to judge the wicked in order for him to be just. Like if God doesn't actually punish the wicked, then he's not really just. But at the same time, he's merciful. Because if you will repent, he'll sweep away those judgments from you. And so the end of Zephaniah is a picture of joy and restoration, which is maybe a picture of sunny, cloudless skies after like that super scary, dark picture. Verse 14 says, Sing aloud, O Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you and has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the true King, the true God, the Lord is in your midst and you shall never again fear evil. And do you know what happens when instead of pride and wickedness and false gods and elevating yourself and trusting in things other than God, do you know what happens in the lives of the people when they worship the true God and when the king is actually in their midst? The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And in a picture entirely unique to Zephaniah, he will exult over you with loud singing. Have you ever thought about that? That God wants to sing songs about you? This section calls for the people to sing and to rejoice and to shout. But the idea that God wants to sing songs about you is unique. We have a two-year-old, um, and I'll spare you guys the actual audio of me singing, but sometimes I like to hold him and sing him and say, you are so beautiful, and you are so loved, and I, I'm just so lucky to have you. And that's what God wants to do over his people who will repent. But it keeps going. And he says, I will take away the reproach for those who mourn, I'll deal with your oppressors. I'll save the lame and the outcast. And I will change all of your shame into praise. And I will restore your fortunes. What a jarring, surprise twist ending to the book of Zephaniah. It is not at all what you would expect reading through the first three and a half chapters. Here's a question for you. Does that idea, that conclusion, does that sound familiar to you? The gospel parallels should be absolutely jumping off the page. The promises of chapter 3 of God actually doing these things for the nation of Judah and Israel, like, never fully physically materialize for the physical nation of Israel and Judah. Those nations are wiped out. So there's a different fulfillment than just for the physical people. And that fulfillment is through Jesus. And that fulfillment also points to the eventual day of the Lord. Not a day of the Lord like this judgment, but the day of the Lord, the ultimate judgment day. There's warnings of idolatry, and complacency that are still very relevant for us today in this book. God deeply cares how you live. And repentance is needed and invited. We too need to seek the Lord. We need to seek righteousness and seek humility. And if we do, Yahweh will hide and protect. Just like he did 
back in the day with Zephaniah, and just like he promised to do. And specifically, he will draw near to us and be in our midst. And he's given us a lot more proof and a lot more context in all of the Bible and knowing what Jesus did for us than just saying, hey, there's judgment coming on these nations and you need to learn from that. He's saying, you want to know how much I love you? Look at what Jesus did. And if we repent and we turn to him and the king is in the middle of your life, he will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. All of your fears and anxiety and shame, he puts that to sleep with what Jesus has done. He will exult over you with singing, like you specifically. He will remove your reproach and your oppressors. He will save the lame and gather up the outcasts, just like you and just like me. And he will change your shame into praise. And he will restore your fortunes. You may not have ever heard a sermon from the book of Zephaniah before, and it's audacious to try and fit in all of that into a single lesson, so I appreciate your perseverance. But isn't this beautiful, y'all? What God has done for you and for me and for his people for all time. And so we can collectively say the same words. Rejoice and shout and sing aloud with all your heart that the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. And you shall never again fear evil. Praise God that that's true because of his love and because of Jesus. That's our lesson for this morning. There's a lot to think about in terms of what the day of the Lord is going to mean and bring and how you can choose to respond in humility or with pride. But hopefully this inspires you to dig deeper into God's word and to see these beautiful pictures of his love for us. I praise you with all of my love. All of my love.